very much, Jennifer. So we have just made our way through a two-part series called Transitions, and we've been thinking about the transitions that we face in life, and so we thought it would be good to enter into a four-part series called Promises. So we're going to be thinking over the next four weeks about the promises that God gives to us in the midst of the transitions that we face in our lives. So simply, let's start with an opening question this morning, and the question is, what's the biggest life transition you've ever faced? What's the biggest transition you've ever faced? And then to add on to that, was it God-initiated? Was that transition initiated by God? We're going to take a look together this morning in God's Word at one of his um, followers who experienced a huge, massive transition, and it was actually initiated by God himself. And so I want to invite you to turn in the Bibles that you have or the devices you have, whatever means you're using to look at. We're going to take a look together at Genesis 12. It's an interesting passage for me because this is the first sermon I ever preached, and it was completely different than what it's going to look like today. It was about three times longer, had thousands more words, and so I'm just grateful that it's not that long. So Genesis 12, let's turn together, but let's rise in honor of God's word this morning. We're going to be looking at the first nine verses that God has for us as we think about the promises that God gives to those of us who are in seasons of transition. So this is the word of our Lord, Genesis 12, 1 through 9. It says, the Lord had said to Abram, leave your country and your people and your father's household and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. And so he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued towards the Negev. So this is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's join together in prayer at this time. Father, we are grateful that in seasons and times of transition and change, that you are stable, that you are constant, that you are faithful, and that you still care about us, and that you still give promises to us, your people. This morning, Lord, as we begin in this uh, four-part series, looking at the promises that you've given to us, may they inspire us and encourage us, and may they help us, Lord, on the path that we find ourselves on today. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you that you still speak to your people, and we thank you that you are still with your people as we journey together. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you, and we pray this in Jesus Christ's name alone, and all of God's children say, amen. So the first thing to notice, I think, is that God calls Abram in verse 1. God calls him, and look at verse 1 with me if you still have your devices open or your Bibles open. God says to Abram, leave your country, leave it. So this isn't a suggestion, it's not a, a, a gentle thought, it's, it's actually an imperative. The verb is an imperative, and God is saying, leave with an exclamation point. Leave your country, too, he says. He's not asking Abraham just to go from Michigan to Indiana, or Michigan to Illinois, where some things are, are the same, restaurants may feel the same, and people may look the same, but he's calling them, actually, in verse 1, to leave his country. Leave your cultures, your customs, your traditions, your language. Face a transition that's so huge that nothing is going to be familiar or comfortable. Have you ever lived outside of the country? Yourself, maybe? The longest I think I've spent was maybe three weeks out of the country. And the time is different. The people are different. The customs, the 
food, even the coffee tastes different. I remember the first time I drank Turkish coffee and I kept stirring it all the way through and the waiter came by and he goes, no, 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 no. You don't stir Turkish coffee. You just let it sit and then the grounds fall down and you drink the top. I, I didn't know that. But different countries have different customs and Abram is being asked to leave everything that's familiar. Everything that he knows and that he's found stability in. And then verse one continues. God says, leave your people so not just geography, leave your people and leave your father's household. In Abram's day, your father's household was everything. It was your community. It was your infrastructure. It was your stability. It was your, the family together would go out and work the, the wheat field and bring in the grain. The family together would work the olive groves and bring in the olives and crush the olives. The family together lived together and did life together. That's why it's so stunning that the prodigal son leaves his, he leaves everything behind. And the audience would have been stunned that day that Jesus shared that story. So Abraham leaves, Abram leaves everything. He, he even leaves, li, leaves his father. In Genesis 11, we learn that Abram's father was named Terah. And he's from the Ur of the Chaldeans, which was a large successful, prosperous city in Mesopotamia. And so he leaves that huge city, the Ur of Chaldeans. Now the word Ur actually means fire. And it's probably descriptive of the idolatrous practices that the people of Ur of Chaldeans practiced as they offered their children to the fire god named Sin, which is an interesting name, isn't it, for a god? So God is saying to Abram, he's saying, leave your sinful practices. Leave everything that brings stability and everything that you know and leave that behind. And I think he's saying, move in a direction that will cause you to cling to me. That I will be the only thing that provides comfort and provides stability for you. I think Abram and Sarah were planning on living out their childish days in comfort in that huge city and knowing that everything was accounted for, and everything could be relied upon. Has God ever asked you to leave something of faith or comfort? Not of faith. Has he asked you to leave something of comfort behind in order to increase your trust in him? Has he ever called you to leave something of stability behind in order to cause you to trust in him? Think through that and maybe write that down in your notes this morning. What is it that he's called you to leave behind? And what was the result? What was the result of you leaving that thing behind? What, what was your response of him calling you to leave that behind? And, and maybe in this next year, in 2023, what is God calling you to strip away and to leave behind you that you're clinging to so that you'll cling to him alone? Is there something you can identify? I need to leave this behind. His family of idolatry for Abram. Look at verse 1. It continues. God says this. It continues in verse 1. He says, The Lord said to Abram, Go to the land that I will show you. Isn't that fascinating? It, it's like being in the inner city, hailing a cab, raising your hand or whistling if you can, and the cab stops and you get in the cab and the driver says to you, Where to, pal? And your response is, I don't know. Just go. And halfway along the route or somewhere along the route as you just drive, I'll let you know where we're going. What? I'll go to the land, go to the land that I will show you, God says. And I think in this moment, God's not calling Abram to a destination, a final destination that he can put in his GPS. I think God's calling him to a relationship. I don't think it's about the destination in this moment, even though we know where it will be. I think God's calling him to a relationship, to trust in him and to say along the way, I don't know where I'm going, but it's okay. Because you know. And so I'll trust in you. It's as if God is removing everything that brings stability and trust for Abram. He, he's removing him from his family. He's removing him from his house, his identity, his past religion, and God is moving him not to a destination, but to a relationship. Will you trust in me? Will you allow me to lead you, God is saying to Abram in this moment. 
Think of the season of transition that we find ourselves in. And could it be that God's not calling us simply to a destination, but he's calling us to a relationship? That he's asking us to trust in him and to find faith in him. You know, the search committee is reading a book together right now by Ruth Haley Barton that's called Pursuing God's Will Together. And our consultant has us reading this. It says, A Discernment Practice for Leadership Groups. And our consultant is reminding us that it's not about making decisions. It's about being discerning. It's about allowing God to already lead where he wants us to be. And we're simply following where he wants us to be. Being behind the one who's leading us forward. The one who says, I'm going to take you to a place, but I'm not going to tell you where it is yet. And are we okay with that? And can you imagine getting in the car with your spouse? And your spouse says, where are we going? What do I put in the GPS? And you're like, I'll tell you in a little bit, because I don't know. I mean, that's crazy. Who would do that? Who would go to a destination yet unknown? What would be your response if God asked you to move to a place not yet shown to you? Would it be, okay, here I am, God, bring me whatever you want? Or would it be more like maybe what I would say? I I'm here, God, but you're going to have to give me a few of the details first. I'm not going to give myself completely to you until you reveal a little bit. So at least I have some sense that either you're not crazy or I'm actually hearing you. Or in this moment, Abram says, okay, whatever you've got, there's no destination in mind. The destination isn't the goal. It's the relationship. It's drawing closer and trusting in him. So Abram is called to go, but God next makes a covenant with him, and he gives him a whole bunch of promises even in the midst of this transition. This is verses 2 through 3. So first of all, God says this. He says, I will make you, in verse 2, into a great nation. I'm going to make you into a great nation. And even though you're 75 and your wife is most likely 65, I'm still going to make you, this childless couple, into a massive great nation. I wonder if they laughed in that moment or if they trusted in the plan that God had for them. Will you trust in God beyond what you can see? If God says, this is what I'm going to do through you, would you trust in that? Or would you look for more details? The second promise, God says, I will bless you. Abram alone will be blessed by God. God's going to put his hand of blessing right upon him and bless him. Third promise, I will make your name great. Can you imagine your name being great? Such that wherever you go, people are like, oh, that's Marshall. But it's not about his name. It's about his name. Can you imagine leaving a room and wondering what people are saying about you? Well, we all do that, right? I wonder what they're saying. Can you imagine leaving a room and having them be like, she is amazing. She is a child of God. She's humble. She's trustworthy. She leans not in her own understanding, but in all her ways, she's trusting in him. I mean, imagine if everywhere you went, they spoke well of your name. And maybe that's happening already. But that's part of the promise that God gives to Abram in this moment. Fourth promise, he says, you will be a blessing. You will be a blessing that, that those you come into contact with, those you interact with, those you work with, those you have dealings with, they're going to be blessed by you. Can you imagine? Well, that really is our call, isn't it? That all those we interact with would find the shalom, the peace of Jesus Christ, and they would come to know him because of our interactions actually with them. Verse 3, we have the fifth promise. God says, they're kind of similar, but he says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. Can you imagine if you said a good word to me, all of a sudden God blessed you? Or imagine if you said a word about me negatively, and you cursed me, and God cursed you. I love how God says, whoever curses you, I will curse. He uses the word twice, and it's actually two different words. The first word just kind of means it's, it's like a, a verbal assault. So anybody who verbally assaults you, the second word curse means a judicial sentencing. So anybody who speaks an ill word of you will be sentenced by God, he's saying. Wow, he just kind of ramps it up, doesn't he? This is the promise to you, Abram. Everywhere you go, whoever blesses you, it's almost like a, a, a slap shot in hockey. It just goes right back to them. The same will be of the curses. 
whoever curses you, they better watch out because it's going right back to them twofold. And then a sixth promise, even in this season of transition, God says, all people on earth will be blessed through you. Can you imagine? Not just in Michigan or Illinois or Wisconsin, or, but the whole U.S., the whole, the whole world is going to be blessed by you, Abram. In this moment of transition, this moment of unaware, or unknown destination, you're going to be blessed with all the promises that God gives to you through these promises in this covenant. Even in your massive transition, God says, I'll be with you. And everybody's going to be blessed because of you being my child. So what's Abram's response? Verses 4 through 9 give us his response. Look at it with me, would you? What's Abram's response? Abram. Verse 4, so Abram left. Huh. (laughs) That's his response. He goes. He doesn't ponder it. He doesn't go reflect on it. He doesn't, like I want to do, form a committee and meet once a month and have decisions made. He takes the command from God in verse 4. He he simply does it. He puts financial security, physical safety, ease, all behind him. And what does he place in front of him? God. God himself will go before you. And Abram allows that. He's, he's part of that process. And sure, he had concerns. I'm sure he had questions. I'm sure he had wonderments. But we don't know those because he simply, in verse 4, just says he goes. What is your response when God calls you to do something that makes no sense? And Marshall went. And you fill in the name. Did you go? Did you respond out of obedience or did you question? Are you a how guy or a wow guy? Are you wow God? Are you like, how in the world is, I think I've turned into a how guy as I've gotten older. How's that going to work? How much money is that going to cost? How are we going to, what are the implications? Instead of just, just go. Find me in obedience, God says. Verse five. Oh, by the way, I think Abraham had no Paralysis of analysis. Have you ever heard that before? He wasn't paralyzed by the thought of change and transition. He didn't overanalyze such that he just couldn't move. He just, he just went. And if you think it was a simple decision, let's take a look at what he did. Verse 5. He took his wife, he took all that he possessed, all that he had accumulated, and all the people, and he sets out. I often thought it was just Abraham, Sarai, and Lot, and they just left. It's his whole clan. It's all of his children. It's all of his servants. It's all of his community that gets up and leaves. So imagine the scene with me, if you would, a day before Abraham leaves. He's sitting with his family, and he's like, hey, um, family meeting. Do you guys do family meetings? We do. Family meeting around the table. we got to talk about something. What is it? And Abraham says, "Um, hmm, tomorrow we're leaving. And his daughter says, where are we going to, Daddy? And he says, I don't know. What? What do you mean you don't know? Well, God hasn't revealed it to me yet. All I know is we're going to be on a journey together. And God will reveal when the time is right. Can you imagine that conversation? I mean, those of you who are here, if you're here this morning, try that. Get in the car with your spouse and say, we're going, but I don't know where. First of all, we can't afford the gas to do that. Secondly, who does that? Is it a God-initiated transition? And if it is, it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. It's about being on the journey with him. Okay, so God tells him to set out. He sets out with his whole family, his clan, all of his people, all their possessions. Verse 7, notice the order of things. The Lord appeared to Abram. Verses 4 and 5, I'm sorry, verse 1, God tells him what to do. 4 and 5, he responds, he packs up everything, gets the Atlas truck, and he just goes and doesn't know where. And then what happens in 7? God appears. Could it be that God's waiting to appear in your life because he wants you to respond? He's waiting for you to say, okay, I'll do it. In this season of transition, it's not about where I'm going. It's about who I'm with. Ooh, that was a good one. Who am I with? And who's with you in this season of transition? 
Okay, I want to use a, a sports analogy, which probably won't work because I don't like sports very much. Football analogy. I used to think life was often like a coach who's God and the football players. And I often thought that God wanted us to be suited up, to be on the team, to be on the sideline. Somebody said, is that we are a marshal? I don't think it is. I don't know what team it is because I don't watch football. I don't really care. But it doesn't matter. I often thought that we were waiting on the sideline. God's the coach, and he's waiting to give us the play until we're suited up and we have the jersey on. I don't think that way anymore. As I get older, I think that God is actually calling us not just to suit up. I don't think that's enough to just call yourself a Christian. I think what he wants from us is to get off from the sideline. He wants us to get in the middle of the field and have no play. To be in the middle of the field and to turn back to him and say, I, I, what are we doing? It's in that moment that we give ourselves completely to him and we find ourselves in the middle of the field with everybody watching and no play that he finally says, okay, you're all in. And you might look ridiculous because you're on the field and you don't know what's happening. Now I'm ready to give you the play. Isn't that a great analogy? It's not about being on the sideline and just waiting. It's about being all in, getting in the car like Abram and saying, I don't know where we're going, and looking back to him and saying, God, and he says, okay, now that you're ready, I'm going to give you the play for the journey. So I guess the question is, are you on the sideline this morning or are you in the field waiting for the play? For some of us, we don't even have, we've got the jersey on and we've got the wrong shoes on. We've, it's time for us to rise up. And it's time for us as the church and as God's people to be in the play. So I don't know about you, but I'm sick of being a fan. I want to be in the game. I want to be making a difference. I want to let people know that it's not about being on the sideline. It's being in the game saying, what have you got, coach? What have you got? In this season of transition, what if God's plan isn't about a destination, but it's about a relationship? It's not about getting there. It's about being here with him. Being here with him in a close relationship with him. I think he wants to see if we will trust him and if we will rely on him in the most difficult times of our lives. Will we rely on him? It makes me think of a man who was a lawyer in a large firm in Chicago he and his wife were strong supporters of D.L. Moody, that great charismatic evangelist. This particular lawyer lost most of his real estate investments in Chicago in 1871. You remember what happened then, the great Chicago fire. That same year, his four-year-old son died from scarlet fever or pneumonia. Two years later, work kept him from traveling with his wife and his four daughters to England. They were going to go and see D.L. Moody preach, and, and the husband couldn't go, and so he stayed behind. While crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the ship hit another iron ship and sank. 226 people died on that day, including all four of his daughters. Annie, age 12, Maggie, age 7, Bessie, age 4, and an 18-month-old baby. His wife survived... And when she arrived in England, she simply telegraphed her husband and said, Saved alone, what shall I do? Saved alone, what shall I do? He took the next ship to England as quickly as he could be. And when he was four days out from England, the captain stopped him and pulled him into his quarters and said, I want you to know that the location we're at right now with this ship is where your four daughters perished. On that same trip, as he's pondering and as he's in anguish and as he's in the biggest transition that's ever happened in his life, and he's mourning the loss of his four young daughters, he ends up writing a song. I'd love for you to hear that song now. When peace like a river 
attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul sing this chorus with me it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul it is well with my You know that song, right? His story did not finish there. This man by the name of Horatio Spafford. Horatio Spafford took the next ship to England. He and his wife moved back to Chicago and had three more children. After having those three children, they actually moved to Israel. And he actually became a missionary with his wife to those who were in need of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He and his wife actually adopted a young Turkish boy from Ramallah, Ramallah, and this young boy actually discovered the Siloam inscription, which is where the Pool of Siloam and the Gihon Spring meet, also known as Hezekiah's Tunnel. Amazing, fascinating story as he goes through insurmountable loss and is actually now currently buried in Jerusalem, he and his whole family, at the Jerusalem University College in the only Presbyterian cemetery in Jerusalem, actually. Um, on the picture, you see the new president of uh, the JUC, Oliver Hersey, and the students that we took. But the next picture actually shows the tombstone of where Horatio is actually buried in Jerusalem. He's 60 or 70 years old. He loses his three children. And what does he end up doing later in life? Becomes a missionary and moves to Jerusalem. Our story is never done, is it? Even in the midst of insurmountable pain and suffering and, and all that he ends up going through in his seasons of transition he clings to the Lord and discovers it's not about a destination. It's about a relationship. Whatever my lot, you have taught me. To, whatever my lot, whatever is in front of me that I don't know, you've taught me to say it is well. It is well with my soul. And so it's my prayer, friends, that in these next few months, we would seek God's will for us and that no matter what, or, no matter what comes our way, we'd be able to say it's okay, because God's with us, and he's given us all kinds of promises, even in the midst of our difficult and celebratory transitions. Thanks be to God that it can be well with our souls, and that he has a place for us in heaven. Let's join together in prayer before we turn our gaze to the table this morning. And so, Lord, we are indeed grateful for what you have done. We're grateful for what you have given, and we thank you, Lord, that you love us and that you call us your children and we thank you, Lord, that you have a place for each one of us if we would but trust in you and if we would give you the leadership reins of our life. Father, for some of us, we are in a massive transition right now. And I just pray, Lord, that as we find ourselves in those transitions, whether it be as a church or as an individual, that we would lean not on our own understanding, but that we would trust in you. And that you would remind us of those promises that you will bless us. You will bless others through us. So we thank you, Lord. We love you, and we give you all the glory. We give you all the honor, and all of God's children say, amen. So today we have an opportunity to be reminded of the fact that even though we are in a season of transition, that God has a plan for us, and he has not left us. Today we get to celebrate the promise.